insights into the lives of three fascinating women of New Mexico's dramatic territorial period. What is it about the women of this time period in New Mexico that you find so fascinating? Well, I started out with Susan McGoffin as a performer, developing her and studying her life and her diary down the Santa Fe Trail and into Mexico. And I found out she's purportedly the first Anglo woman into this part of the world. So I thought, hmm, that's quite an experience to come into northern New Mexico, which was at that time the Republic of Mexico. And so I know her uh, diaries become a very important primary source document. Yes, and it was during a fabulous year, of not only for trading on the Santa Fe Trail from Independence, Missouri to Santa Fe and then on down to Mexico, but because it was during the great Mexican-American War of 1846, 47, and 48, when our president at the time, President Polk, um, initiated and encouraged Manifest Destiny, which means the United States nearly doubled in size after that time period. Why were her observations so important? What do they tell us about that time? Well, she <coughs> was inundated almost immediately from Bent's Fort on with the Hispanic culture. And at first she was very shy and withdrawn about it because she was almost like a puritanical Presbyterian woman. And she did things so differently from the women here. But the more she went down the trail, the more ladies she met along the way, and the Hispanic culture is number one, Megan, very hospitable. They greeted her with open arms, offered her food and their homes and everything else, and she slowly let down her uh, barriers, if you will, and started to get to know them as people. I thought that was very interesting because she had, like a lot of Americans, mm -hmm. some rather prejudicial and racist views of Mexicans, and it she evolved. She evolved, and, and a lot of people have criticized her for that, but actually she had a sister-in-law. Her brother-in-law, James, was married to a very prominent Spanish woman of the time. She was cousin, a first cousin, to Don Manuel Armijo, the last Mexican governor. So she wasn't totally unrealistic un, uh, about knowing Hispanic people, but uh, it seemed like she was prejudiced, but basically I think she was shy, and it was a culture she didn't understand yet. But like I said, with time, she just opened up to them and she chose to learn to speak Spanish from the beginning of her journey. And by the end of her journey, she could speak fluent Spanish with everybody. Now, of course, one of the most uh, renowned women she met and some infamous in some circles was <laughs> Doña Tulis. Oh, yes. <laughs> and she wrote about who was Doña Tulis? Why, why is she so interesting that you wanted to do a character based on. Donia Tulis, according to Mark Simmons, the great historian, she is the most important Hispanic woman in all of the 1800s in the Southwest. And she really represents that gateway, if you will, between the world of America or back east and the Hispanic culture of New Mexico and Mexico. She opened her arms to both cultures. And with the Santa Fe Trail, they all came through and they all got to meet her including Susan McGoffin. She was a very good Monty player. The and greatest. She ran a gambling house, which I think <laughs> Susan McGoffin looked askance upon as being morally uh, improper. Yes, you said it exactly right. I'm sure Susan never went to the gambling house, but I know her husband, Samuel, did. I know her brother-in-laws, William and James, gambled there. But of course, she was a lady and never would have done that. But uh, Doña Tulis's gambling hall was all along Borough Avenue, right across from where the Lensic Theater is today. And that was one of the most important gambling halls in all of northern New Mexico. She was quite wealthy by the time she died. She did well. She did very, very well. Remember, she's a businesswoman first. How did she make her business happen or her money happen? She made most of it in her gambling hall, but she invested in Santa Fe and Camino Real trade. Camino Real would be from Santa Fe all the way to Mexico City. All those wagons and freight wagons and so forth that came through, she was a part of uh, gleaning and investing in their businesses. So she made money that way too. She's, so she was very successful, a little controversial, uh, mm -hmm. especially among the Anglos, but <laughs> um, a pragmatist who saw what was happening. She did. And capitalized she did. on it. 
uh, Megan, absolutely true. And all of the uh, soldiers and other traders would write about Doña Tulis and say, oh, I've wined with her, I've dined with her, I've met her, I've been to her gambling hall. And it was the most, like I said, impressive place in Santa Fe uh, to go and gamble. Uh, first hardwood floors, Brussels carpets on some of the gaming rooms, the first glass windows, the first clock in Santa Fe was there, chandeliers from the ceilings. It was a fun place to go and everybody gambled in New Mexico. Now, it, uh, another interesting woman who spent time on the Santa Fe Trail with her husband's freight company yes. and then made her home in Las Cruces was uh, Mamie Aguirre. Yes. She also came from Missouri or from back east. Well, actually, she was a southern girl, too, just mm -hmm. like uh, Susan. Susan was from Kentucky. Uh, Mamie Bernard Aguirre, she was, her family uh, lived, she is, as a young girl lived in Baltimore in a big, beautiful home there with her grandparents. But her father had this, this lust for going out west and starting stores and being a part of the westward movement, you know. And uh, so when he started stores in Missouri, especially in Westport. Well, her family all moved out there and her mother was reluctant to do so at first, but that's how she got to Missouri. And of course, it was at a very formidable time of the, of the year yeah. uh, for American history speaking because it was during the Great Civil War. That started up when she was living there in Westport. That's where she met her husband and who took her out here. Yes, indeedy. She made the first Confederate flag for the Missouri volunteers to carry to the Southern United States to fly. She made it for them, flew it for them outside a window, and uh, her father said, oh my goodness, caused a riot. <laughs> and so when Epifanio Aguirre came from Las Cruces with his freight wagons, which she was prone to do on a regular basis, he proposed to this young woman via her father. She couldn't speak Spanish, he couldn't speak English, or very little. And they got together and they were married within a month and they both learned to speak their respective languages. They got married right there in Westport. She also wrote many journals um, and was prolific about describing her experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she, she lost Epifanio, uh, to an Indian raid later when they were married, but, and then returned to Missouri, then came back here. She yes. made the Southwest her home. She made the Southwest her home, and she said, well, how, I, how can I as a widow woman do that? Well, the first um, governor of Arizona, Governor Goodwin, said, come on over to Arizona. I'll give you some work as a teacher, and she got started teaching. What was her, why was she so important to this time period? What were her Well, because I traits? think, um, Megan, she was definitely, like Susan, uh, a cog in the wheel of progress moving forward, of cultures hooking together. But she stayed longer out west, if you will, than Susan did. Susan went back home to Kentucky. Eventually, she did move to St. Louis. But uh, little Mamie Aguirre made her roots, had her roots sunk into the southwest. She loved the Hispanic people. She loved the freedom and the hospitality and the joy that they had. She said, oh, we don't find that back in the southern United States. It's interesting. What what do these women leave us with? How do they change our perceptions? Women in New Mexico. I think that you they gave me they give me the perspective that no matter where you go in life, no matter how different another culture is or another country or people, you find out who they are. Talk to them. Get to know them. You usually do it over a meal or sharing something like, here, here's a tortilla. I'll show you how to make it. Or here's my baby's clothing. I'll show you how to make these clothes. I'll make a pattern for you. Mamie Aguirre started New American Baby Clothes in Las Cruces for the women. Those little episodes bring you together, but they had above all, a, not just a perseverance or determination to live a new life, but they wanted to be number one with their husbands and they wanted to be out west where there was freedom. Freedom that they did not have back east. And I think a lot of women here in New Mexico can say the same thing. Once you're here, you don't want to go back east or west. <laughs> Well, Van Ann Moore, thank you so much for coming and talking to us about these fascinating women in our history. Thank you.